He is, is a 20-year veteran of the professional or commercial game industry. He has worked in uh, many uh, studios, among them uh, Universal Studios, Sony uh, Computer Entertainment, and also Electronic Arts. He was also an adjunct professor in the University of Southern uh, California in the School of Cinematic Arts. And he's generally interested in the uh, creative process, in product uh, development, and also innovation. And uh, he has also a strong liking of understanding how games and learning uh, go together. And so let's welcome him for today's talk, Pedagogy of uh, Game Design. All right, so that's a quick introduction. I'll go through a little bit more detail. Uh, so this is a few of the, of the places I've worked. Uh, right now I am the program director of a master's program at UC Santa Cruz in games and playable media. We run that out of our satellite campus in Santa Clara. It's a professional master's program. Uh, some, a few other highlights, I worked in a nonprofit called Glass Lab where we made educational games for about three years. The highlight of that, of course, was meeting Mr. Keith Devlin. Um, I had my best title, I think, at Electronic Arts where my title was Senior Creative Director at Large. Um, which I like to tell people was pretty much as awesome as that sounds. I got to do more or less whatever I wanted for about six years at Electronic Arts. Um, I had a startup of my own that I called Method Games. I originally wanted to call it Monster Box. Um, quick lesson in intellectual property law. I got a cease and desist letter from the Monster Cable Company. Um, they will not let anybody found a company with the name Monster in it. So I don't ever buy Monster Cables and neither should you. <laughs> um, and then I, I, a long time ago, I worked at, at uh, Universal Interactive Studios, and kind of a little known piece of trivia, uh, two of the most successful studios kind of in the history of games, which was Insomniac and Naughty Dog, were all cramped into one little suite, and my office was in the middle. Um, so that was really kind of an interesting time. But now I teach game design. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how I tried to figure out how to do this and what I think I've learned and, and how I think it's gone. Um, I've only got just a couple years of teaching, but I spent more than 10 years of my career really mentoring people, and so I kind of feel like I actually have a lot more experience than it looks like on paper. Um, and I've also, if, if I may say, I've, I'm pretty good at it. Um, <clears throat> I've uh, got very, very high ratings so far in my teaching, so I feel like, okay, something is working here. Uh, but at the same time, I kind of feel like this a lot of the time. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the commercial industry. Now I'm kind of going toward the academy, and I hope I don't fall because it looks really, really painful. Um, <clears throat> but I also think that this puts me in a really kind of unique and advantageous position. Um, so when you talk about learning craft, uh, there are two basic models of, of learning. And, and the first one would be apprenticeship. And apprenticeship, of course, is how I learned the craft. There was simply no way to go to school for game design when I decided I wanted to be a game designer. So there's me. This was my primary mentor, a guy named Mark Cerny. Mark and I worked together for more than 10 years. Um, he's now best known as the primary architect of the PlayStation 4. But he had done a lot of things before that. And Mark actually had a mentor. It was this man, Yuji Naka. Yuji Naka was the creator of Sonic the Hedgehog. So that's, that's this, uh, it turns out I have two degrees of separation from Sonic the Hedgehog, which is kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's this sort of pedigree that we have. Uh, Mark always wanted me to call him Sensei, I never did. Um, and I probably never will, but my students call me Sensei. Uh, <clears throat> I'm really competitive. Um, and then just to kind of go the other direction, so I had the opportunity to mentor a lot of people, but one of those people who's kind of a nice example is this guy, it's Brian Algeyer. Brian is the, the creative director at Insomniac. And I encourage you to go out and buy Ratchet and Clank, the new game that came out today, uh, which was one of, I, I think it's kind of Brian's piece de resistance, resistance um, and a movie's coming out in a few days as well. So um, this is kind of elaborate pedigree of, of apprenticeship, and this is how we've done it, right? This is how we've learned to make video games historically. But then I made all of them go away because I wanted to do higher education. And this is a pretty popular idea. This is from October the 15th. Uh, this was published by the ESA, which is the Entertainment Software Association. There are 406 counted higher education programs in video game development in the United States as of that date. 406. The only states that don't have one are Alaska, 
North Dakota, Mississippi, and Maine. <laughs> Every other state has at least one. Um, I think California has the most with 66. So it seems like it's kind of a popular idea. Um, so I'm not too alone, but it also still feels like we're in this sort of or space between you either learn by doing or you learn by some sort of academic progression. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, and this will depend a little bit on time. A lot of times people say, oh, I'm going to go really fast. We're going to have time for questions at the end. Um, here's the truth. I have absolutely no idea how long this game talk is going to take. So what I did is I put a branching point in the middle. So we'll decide how far we want to go. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to start by doing what I call teaching in the school of hard knocks, uh, which is sort of how I learned game design and how I've, I've transitioned that into a, a learning model of game design. And then we'll choose between what we, where we want to go beyond there. Um, my first job as a game designer came in 1994. I was the level designer. I designed all the levels on this uh, reasonably crappy first-person shooter called Disruptor. Um, actually, the levels were really good, but the rest of the game... <laughs> uh, uh, this is actually true. The levels were pretty good. Um, however, the storyline... Um, this is when I worked for Universal Studios, and uh, someone decided it would be a really good idea to have someone from the studio like write the script and film it and direct it and all that stuff and it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible and embarrassing and I hope no one ever sees it. Like if this is ever remastered, it needs to be remastered without the story bits. But there was no such thing as a game designer in 1994. It wasn't a career. So I had to carry a different title and my title was producer because producer at least was something you could understand especially if you worked in a Hollywood studio, which I did. And it actually took five years before I could get a credit as a game designer. Um, most of the people uh, who, who were working in games prior to that, you had to be either a coder, which I can't do, you had to be an artist, which I'm even worse at, or I guess that means you must be a producer because at least I can pay you. So it took a long time to be considered a game designer. And what's more, being a game designer kind of stinks a lot of the time. Uh, everyone who you work with thinks they could do your job better than you and you must be lazy and worthless. And I'm not quite sure why you're here. You mostly just get in the way and ask us to do things that you then change your mind about. That's kind of the experience of being a game designer. So you go through this for 5, 10, 15 years before you finally start getting some respect and then somebody says, hey, I'm going to teach students to do your job in a year. And you go, yeah, right. And this is what it looks like. I just Googled this last night. If I type in game designer, this is the first things that come up on Google. Those are all paid, of course, but like, they're all like, game design schools, right? So <clears throat> there has been a certain amount of resistance inside the industry uh, to this idea. Uh, when I first started at Electronic Arts, um, I, I had actually befriended uh, Tracy Fullerton, who is uh, the person who heads of all of the game design programs at USC. And I thought, you know what would be really cool is I could bring Tracy over to Electronic Arts and she could give a talk about how they do game design, how they teach young people to be game developers at USC, and that'll be really cool. And Tracy said, that sounds like a great idea. And she came to EA and it was like one of the worst experiences of my life. Um, there was not a lot of uh, generosity in the room toward that idea, put it that way. Um, the words you are all special snowflakes, I'm sure, came up. It was not actually a very fun experience. So that means that there's a lot of kind of institutional resistance to this idea. And I think I kind of divide it into two categories that sound similar but are actually very different. Um, and, and I'm going to start with the second one here, which is to be, preserved, to be perceived as credible. So if I'm going to train someone and and say, I've trained this person to be a game developer. What do I need to train that person in to be perceived if they're going to go do this as craft in the future as credible? And it kind of comes down to this. I need to teach you things like teamwork. I need to teach you that these are the different roles on a team in game development. Um, this is how we develop the game software. This is how we test it. We do user testing, all that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, this is, a, for those of us that have been studying education for a while, this is what we would call 21st century skills, right? Um, I don't know if you knew, who's heard this term, 21st century skills? Okay, yeah, it's a very, very popular idea right now in K-12 education is we should be teaching children 21st century skills, things like this, collaboration, um, cooperation, 
problem solving. Or as one of my friends in education likes to say, 15th century skills. But anyway, <coughs> um, these are the things that we teach because that's what the people in industry will value and that we can say, okay, look, we've prepared these people um, for, for that career. And that's cool, but I don't think it's actually very interesting. Even though uh, what you see on the right here is an article that I wrote along with Mark Cerny, my mentor, um, that, that actually got quite a bit of notoriety and is still used in sort of production methods. Um, <clears throat> so just to talk a little bit about what that production method is, because this, if you, who, who here would, would like to go into games at some point in your life? All right, excellent. I know an excellent master's degree program, by the way. Um, this is something you might like hear about at some point. This, it's often called the Cerny method. We just call it method. The world attached Mark Cerny's name to it because his name is way cooler than mine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it basically says we divide the creation of a game into four distinct segments. Ideation, what might I do? Pre-production, what, might, what might that look like? Production, let's build it. And then lately I talk about also post-production, which is, I guess it's still broken, let's fix it. Um, or let's try to make money from it, if that's the other perspective. So, so, like I'm the creator of this, it's still supposedly a big deal, I'm a co-creator of that, but I still don't actually find it that interesting. Um, I think it's a, it's a sort of floor of credibility that we have to have in order to be a game development program that's going to be taken seriously by the game development community but it actually isn't that interesting. So this is the other bit, which is what I think is credible. And what I think is actually interesting going forward. So this was the part where I had to start reverse engineering what I know about game design. I've spent 20 some years being a game designer. How does that work? How is that something other than just intuitive? And um, it's kind of interesting because I actually, if you were to look at my whole history, I, I, I put up some studios there, but I actually spent a lot of time working independently and as a consultant. So game design consultant means you get on an airplane, you go somewhere, you walk in, someone says, please play this game for about 15 minutes and tell me exactly what's wrong with it and how to fix it. So you do, right? Which means two things. First is, I have to really understand well how to fix games. And two is, I have to make those people believe that it's magic and that no one else could figure it out. Because if anyone else could figure it out, they wouldn't have to pay me the absurd amount of money I'm gonna charge you for this. So I had to become this magician and I had to, it was sort of incentivized to make it seem incomprehensible. Magic. Um, <clears throat> would anyone like to see a magic trick? I need a volunteer. Who's a volunteer? I heard, I see one up there. Is that you? Come on down. <laughs> What's this? Uh, controller. For a? Uh, PS. PlayStation. PlayStation. It, specifically a PlayStation what? Uh, I don't know, I'm an Xbox guy. Oh. <laughs> I should have, thank you. I should have brought my, my Xbox controller. I'd like you to hold that in your hand. I'd like you to show us, if you could, um, you're playing a driving game. Hold, hold it up like this so everyone can see. Now, sh now just, you're going around a corner to the right. That's the other right, there you go. <laughs> now you're going around a corner to the left. Now you're going straight. Now you're going to right again. Really hard to the right. All right, excellent. <laughs> now here's the thing. Thank you, stay here. A lot of times you might talk to someone who's building a driving game and they'll go, I don't understand why people keep driving off the road to the left. They keep veering off to the left instead of going straight, especially people who don't play a lot of driving games, a hand on the controller and they keep driving off the road to the left. Can anyone figure out why that might be true? Lever's not broken. Is it because um, the directional joystick is on the left hand side? It's not, it's not because it's on the left hand side. These are good guesses. You can use the right trigger to accelerate. 
Uh, so that would be like torquing the, your hand somehow, the right trigger? No, but good idea. Left or right hand dominant? No. Do it again. I'm See if you right. can figure it out. Is it the gyro tilting? Not the gyro. Does this happen in the UK too? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's agnostic to where the steering wheel is on the car. <laughs> so here's the funny thing. When these controllers were made, does anyone remember what the Nintendo 64 controller looked like? Yeah. What did that look like? So anyone describe it? I get to do this. Nintendo 64 controller looks like this, right? And where was the analog joystick? It was right here. Now, what's different about that controller versus this one? That one is like this, right? What's the difference? I'll give you a hint, it's about 45 degrees. So it turns out, thank you, the hinge of your thumb moves your thumb at an angle something like this. This reads zero straight up. The player presses zero like that. So they end up overcorrecting the wrong direction. And all you have to do is go into the code that reads this controller. You're done. <laughs> Thank you for my magic trick. Thank you. And just offset it by about 30 degrees clockwise. And suddenly people aren't driving off the road anymore. They aren't jumping in the wrong direction. They aren't kicking the ball at the wrong player. Whatever game you're happening to be making, fixed it. And do I tell them how I did that? Absolutely not. I went to a programmer who was sitting in a corner. I said, are you the one who does the controller input? And she says, yeah. And I go, here's what you're going to do. You're just going to take that and rotate it 30 degrees. She says, why? I said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go, you know what? We did another play test, and it's perfect. What did you do? And I go, magic. Uh, That'll be $1,000. <laughs> That's what it means to be a game designer where you want to make a lot of money, right? You got to learn all this stuff. It's got to be magic. But yet, now I'm going to go teach it to a bunch of undergraduates. And this is actually what happened to me. So two and a half years ago or so, Tracy Fullerton calls me again and she says, will you teach my class, which is sort of the 101 class for game development and game design at USC? And I said, sure. I have no idea how to do that. But sure. Um, fortunately, Tracy has a book, and you can use the book, which helps a lot. Um, but ultimately, it meant that I had to go and like reverse engineer all of these ideas in, I had in my head um, that would sort of outcome in this, create this magical outcome so that I could teach it. I also had to believe that that was not unethical, but that's sort of the fundamental part of this whole talk. So here we go. Are you ready? Because this is going to go really fast. Okay, this is the really, really distilled version. The first thing I needed to do is define what I think a video game is. Every single person you talk to who teaches video games has a different definition. If they don't, they cheated. So this is mine. And I'm gonna call out some of the parts I think that are interesting. First of all, it's an interactive system. If you can't play with it, it's not a game. It has loops of activity. Everything you do in a game, you do more than once. If you did it only once, that's not game anymore. That's some sort of story experience, perhaps. It's designed to create an experience so it doesn't exist except in the head and the player. And I also like to include in the heart of the player. Because the best games don't just operate on your head, they also operate on your heart. That's my definition. And that's what I use for starters for all, the, all my students. So now, let's look, what's an interactive system? Simple loop that goes like this. You have a state, the current state of the game. The player performs an action. That action has an outcome, which we can now describe as the new state of the game. Keep doing this, and that's how you have a game. So here's three examples. And this doesn't get, this is not that complicated. So we have chess. The state is basically the board and all the positions of the pieces on the board. Um, 
One more very important piece of state in chess. Rules. Rules. Whose turn is it? Yeah. Oh, and the rules. But like, we'll just consider the state for the moment. Um, in uh, a sport, you have the field, the ball, the whatever, the crowd. Is it home or away, the current score? Those actually get pretty, pretty deep. Or in Angry Birds, you have you know, the stack of stuff. And how many birds you have left, that kind of thing. So that's, this is the state. And then the player is going to take an action. That action is going to have an outcome. And there you go. There's an interactive system. It's not that complicated. So that's a game system. Now, this works pretty well. This tells you how you should build a game. I should start with a state machine. I should have that state machine be able to be modified by players. And when that modification occurs, I should, mod I should change the state. But it actually is nice from a conceptual level. It's not very useful from a game design level. So I add another one, which is a different way of looking at it. Kind of the same thing. Affordance is a term that comes from the world of kind of product design or user, basically user experience. It was, it was coined by a guy named Donald Norman, um, who wrote probably my favorite design book ever called The Design of Everyday Things. Just means when I look at a thing, what does that thing seem like it should do? The classic Norman example is you look at a door and if it has one of these bars like this and, and a bar has kind of a thing that compresses on it, what do you think you should do with that door? Push on it. If it has a handle that juts out like this, what do you think you should do? Pull on it. How many times have you seen the one with the handle that you're actually supposed to push? Right? That's called stupid. Um, so that's bad affordance, actually, is the term that we like to use. Okay, so then action is the same. The player's gonna take some kind of action depending on what sort of input device they might have. Very, very important. Their actions effect on the state must have discernible feedback. And this is separate from affordance. This is where most of the games fail when they're being built. Um, the most common type of feedback you can think of is it exploded. So the state now effect of that is it's gone, but the feedback is it exploded. And the two things are surprisingly different. So that's become very, very important in, in sort of getting at this player experience piece. And that's kind of it. If you understand that, right, just this loop, right, that's all you need to know to make actually a credible game. And that's really scary for me because I'm telling you that 22 years of experience brought me down to one PowerPoint slide. <clears throat> but it kind of did. Now obviously there's more. Obviously there's more. But that's, it, that's where we start for all of the learning that I do in my courses. Um, <clears throat> By the way, the, I want to back up just for a second. The, the feedback piece, right, it exploded, is the main reason that paper prototyping fails. So a lot of people use paper prototyping to, to design their games, and that's cool for the state action effect thing, but it is actually lousy for this. It's lousy because you can't build good affordances, and it's lousy because you can't build good feedback. All right, so have we achieved credibility? Here we are in the School of Hard Knocks. Have we actually educated people? Extrinsically, I don't think that's that hard if you just work at it. Teach people how to work as a team, teach people how to get along, teach people how to develop iteratively, use design, you know, basic design practices, that kind of thing. Yes, you can do it. Um, I'm gonna give us, as game educators, a work in progress on the inter intrinsic thing, because I don't see a lot of that theory being taught well. And that actually leads us to this point. So. Branching point, branching narrative. Who would like to hear more design theory where we can talk about things like emergence, proper experience design, and generating meaning through mechanics? Or project-based curriculum, which is how we mostly build these kind of programs in schools, and why we do it, how we're, I think, kind of screwing it up, and where we might go next. So we can go either way. How many votes for this one? And how many votes for this one? Looks like this one has it. Oh, can I just keep doing this? This was fun. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, more design theory. Here we go. Who's heard the term emergence before? What does emergence mean? 
Anyone? Uh, in human design, like, when systems create behavior that isn't like programmed or necessarily intended by it. That isn't purely predicted. Right. That's right. So it's any behavior that is not purely predicted uh, in advance by a system, right? It's, it's emergent. Um, and I'm not going to go into like this whole philosophical of like, does that really exist and whatnot. Let's just say yes, it exists. Um, <clears throat> and one of the uh, common errors that I see is for people try trying to create games that have emergence, is say, well, I'll take this system and I'll make it more complicated. I'll add more variables to that loop, which turns out to be precisely the incorrect way to do it. The, way, the correct way to do it is to add more loops and then link them together. So. Uh, well, I have examples. Why wouldn't I? So let's talk about this. Here's one. Now the knight in chess is the most fun piece. It moves two different directions. It can jump over other characters. It's got all kinds of fun stuff going on. So you would think, basically then, that the knight versus knight should be an excellent game. <laughs> I actually made people play this in class. It's like, come on. Like this is, you get a literal ta table flip sometimes because it's just so terrible, right? So why is the one on the right so much more interesting? Well, none of those pieces have particularly complex rules. As a matter of fact, most of them have incredibly simple rules, like the king, or the, well, the pawns are actually the most complex, but like most of them, the rules for a given piece are very, very simple. Go, I could have put go up and it'd be even more simple. But when you link them together, you get this thing that's emergent that took like the biggest computers ages to even figure out. This is a game that I'm very familiar with and this is my personal representation of its systems. It's a little bit abstract. But I call that SimCity. <laughs> uh, we worked, uh, when I was with Glass Lab, we worked quite a bit with SimCity. And that's kind of how it works. And in fact, this is really the design of all games by Maxis. So Maxis games are probably the historically most emergent games. The Sims, SimCity, right? If you go all the way back to SimAnt and whatever. Who knows what's going to happen when you boot up a Maxis game? Well, the answer is not very much, but just a whole lot of it. And they're all touching each other. So. Um, one of the kind of, remember I was at Electronic Arts, so I got to see how this works a little bit. One of the kind of rules they have on The Sims is someone would like to add a new feature. So they're going to judge, was that feature worth doing or not worth doing? The metric they use is, how many other features does that feature touch? The larger that number is, the more worthy the idea is. It's not how complex is that feature to execute or understand. It's the opposite. Simple feature that touches dozens of things means that will create a very large emergent outcome, which is exactly what The Sims is about. And I, I found that really fascinating. So a given, this is a very, very simplified version of how The Sims works. Uh, you have an object. The object is a couch. The couch has some basic characteristics like how big it is and what it looks like. It also says, I am here for sitting. And I have a radius of this. And then there's a chair. And that chair says, I also am here for sitting. And I have a radius of this. And depending on where the player puts those, that character might sit there or might sit there or might not sit at all. And it becomes this very, very unpredictable system. But the actual logic is incredibly simple. It says, I am a couch. I am here for sitting. Uh, I might also be, I am here for sitting. And I am excellent for sitting and watching television. I tend to afford sitting that lasts a long time, and the chair will be I tend to afford sh short sessions of sitting. But these are, again, they're very, very simple little rules, like a chessboard, that play out by the system. And you end up needing very, very little randomness to make that really, really emergent. So that's cool, right? It's easy. You can all do that. Here's another one. <clears throat> Experience design. Game designers love to talk about Six Sigma Mahai. Mihai Six Sigma Mahai. We don't like to spell it. Um, <clears throat> but he wrote a book called Flow, which, um, okay, two books you have to read after you leave here. You have to read Donald Norman's The Design of Everyday Things, and you have to read Mihai Six Sigma Mahai's Flow, and I forget what the rest of it is, something about optimal experience. Who cares? It's called Flow. 
and it's an amazing book. And he talks about, um, this is actually a graphic from his book, about what it feels like to be in that perfect flow state. He's a big tennis player. And he talks about when you're playing tennis against someone who you, with, against whom you are perfectly matched. And you like, feel like everything's just working for you. So in video games, we're constantly trying to build that state. Here's the thing, we tend to do it in a way that is naive and incorrect. And it's all right there in that graph, which is that flow is not a one-dimensional line, it's not linear, it's a two-dimensional band or channel. And so you have to actually take the person out of comfort, back into comfort, out of comfort, and back into comfort, and like that, indefinitely, so they actually remain interested. Because being at your perfect state of like, this task is perfectly matched to my abilities is fundamentally unstable, which is kind of weird. You would think like, no, that's how it's supposed to be perfect all the time, but that's actually wrong. So you can think of games that do this. Um, by the way, this is the basis on which we build dynamic uh, difficulty systems. And uh, if you play a lot of games, a lot more games have dynamic difficulty than you know. So, sorry. Um, I destroyed someone's youth recently giving a lecture about that. Um, <clears throat> so we build that to try and, try and get that in a perfect state. The other thing about experience design is sequencing. We want stuff to go kind of random-ish. So why would we make it kind of random-ish? So it feels random? So it feels random. Why wouldn't we make it a, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, D. Because it's predictable. What's wrong with predictable? It's boring. These are all very vague terms. Um, <clears throat> here's, here's, a, here's an example. Um, and this is from an actual game that EA did a number of years ago called Dead Space. And the top is the sequencing under which they introduced the bad guys that would come try to eat your face. And the bottom is the sequencing under which they introduce the puzzles and sort of unique little gameplay bits. And what we discovered, unsurprisingly, was that people found the combat boring and the exploration exciting. Um, the unfortunate bit is that the team had invested so much time in all these different enemies and so much money in creating and animating them, and yet after about the fourth enemy, users stopped perceiving that there was anything new at all in there. And they were just like, oh, I think I'll kill a bad person. And they stopped caring what, the, what it might behave like. But in the in case of the puzzles and the zero gravity things and all that kind of stuff, it was exciting because you never knew what was coming next. Essentially, it's the same experience as if you're walking through a haunted house. Or I really like to have people like just go to Disneyland and go on the teacups ride and then go on like the Indiana Jones ride. And like, how are those different? The teacups is great for children because they like that kind of repetition. They don't care. But as soon as you get sort of cognitively mature, that no longer works for you. And you need to have something that is uh, fundamentally unpredictable or else it's not real. There's this sort of uncanny valley of experience that says if that experience repeats too frequently or at a, in a way that I can predict, then it's not real and I don't care. Um, I actually have this really fun, fun slide. I should have put it in here. of. Uh, there's like a savanna with a tiger in it and the same savanna with no tiger in it. And people can identify the difference between those two photos in like a tiny fraction of a second. But as like a computer vision task, it would be brutal. So we're really good at this. Like we see patterns really, really fast. So you have to hide your patterns. Um, this was a so fun thing I had one of my students do recently. Um, this illustrates how he needed to change his game because it was way too predictable and simple. Um, <clears throat> I also really liked that he had actually tracked absurdity as, as a metric. But th you know, that, uh, these things have to, have to cross over more than that. So he's working on fixing that. All right, this is more, this is just like good stuff. Um, meaning through mechanics, so this is interesting. Um, usually when we make games, we think of them in terms of what you do and then maybe uh, where it is or what the story might be and then finally like how that makes me feel. I think when you think about games as a player, this is the way you think. I did stuff, it took me to a place, it made me feel excited, it made me feel afraid, it made me feel joyful, it made me feel whatever. Um, 
And that's a really kind of easy way to start planning to make a game. Um, <clears throat> I played this other game when, blah, blah, blah. And this is a very common way of making games. It's, you end up with something like that. It's a survival shooter. It's on the moon. And I guess you're scared or something. Awesome, let's make it. And it's really good for making sequels and stuff like that. So I got to be around that for a long time in my life. Um, <clears throat> There's like we can start like messing around with that. So what if we put the premise on the outside, and then we made some functions, and then there's an emotion, and that's what we do when there's a story game, right? Uh, four people marooned on desert island. There's a space marine, whatever, and basically you end up with what's this? This would be lost in space, the game, um, and oftentimes kind of vacant when it comes time to the, get to the emotion piece. And I just find all this kind of uninteresting. And I asked my, my students to try to flip it inside out. So instead of starting with what the game does, start with how you want the player to feel. What, what would happen if you just started with that? So let's play with that. Let's play with that. Um, this will work less well with this crowd. Here's, here's one I do a lot. Um, can you all name something that you have to do every day that you find annoying? Find what was it? Find parking. Find parking. I heard driving. Yeah, that usually comes up. Driving in traffic, find parking. Shaving. Pardon? Shaving. Shaving. <laughs> I want to make Keith's game. <laughs> Not necessarily. Um, so, uh, so this comes up very often as it's, uh, it's driving in traffic. So what's the emotion that you get from, from that? From trying to find a parking spot or I'm driving and it's like, what does it feel like? You're getting patient. Alert. You're alert, definitely alert. Oh, these are good. So what then would be something that you might like to do that would be an expression of those emotions if you could. Get some kind of reward for like You could get a reward for finding a parking space. Would it yeah. Have like a sense of progress in relation to your search for parking? You could do that. You could do that. Bash what was this last one? Bash another car out of the way. Bash another car right out of the way. Just bash it out of the way. How would that feel? She's like, yes, that. <laughs> Who's played a game called Burnout? That's exactly what that game is. That's exactly what that game is. You drive really fast amongst traffic. You're very alert because you're going, I think that it's going like something like 220 to 250 miles an hour because they've scaled it really weird. Um, you hit cars, and when you hit cars, you are rewarded with points and extra boost. Go. You're like, she's like, yeah, that's my game. <laughs> so this is an example where you start with an emotion, and you build outward into the features. And now you say, well, what are some other features we can add to burnout? And like, that's going to get easy now. Like, it's got to fit, but it's not that hard to make it fit when you know what the emotion is. So this is something that I've added to the curriculum that we do at Santa Cruz is <clears throat> I make my students do prototypes based on an emotion. And the emotion must be reflected in the actual mechanics and the actual functions of the game. So you can't say boo and say that's scary. You actually have to have something jump out at you or something, whatever you're going to do for scary. And some of these get pretty hard. Um, the way I do it is that, I, that we do a a random roll to which one you get, and then you have to build that game. And then we bring in people to play it, and they have to guess which one you had. This, this has been so, so much fun. Um, <clears throat> I think our best one we had this year was probably either, we had one for loss and one for confusion. They were both really, really good. The loss one was terrible, sad, terribly sad. Um, you had two characters. One was a yeah. When, when, when do you want to get boredom? When you get boredom? Yeah. We had somebody get boredom, and they made something that was boring. 
Um, they actually, that was incredibly difficult. Because how do you make it boring without it being stupid? Because stupid doesn't count. Because people, people just go, well, this is incompetent. That's not, that's not what we're going after. Um, I could definitely come up with something, but let me, let me talk about loss because we were going there. So we, ha we have two characters. One is a pad of Post-its and the other one is a Sharpie. And, they, and you go through this thing where like, it's a cooperative, two-player two cooperative thing and you have to get through all these like, platforming challenges. And then you get to the very end and only the Sharpie can make it. And the Post-it is left behind forever. <laughs> and the farther they are apart, the more the screen fades to black and white and out of color. And they, and they took it all like photographing the top of their desk, you know, so... And, and people played it and they were like... <laughs> loss. You know, some people mistake it, mistook it for love, which was interesting. But yeah, loss was pretty good. Boredom. I mean, we could talk about this forever, right? But this is such a fun, fun task. And what it, what it gets to is, um, is this particular other definition of game, which came from the very famous game designer, Sid Meier, who's in this photograph. Sid's the creator of Civilization, most famously. And <clears throat> uh, he defined games as a series of, of interesting choices. And I kind of like to twist that a little and say a series of meaningful choices. So if the player's choices evoke that emotion, then you're going to get somewhere interesting. That's where your boredom one gets difficult, right? Is the, the choices have to become mundane or something. But, but where it's very clear that the player is only given you know, that. Or I, you might think like a teenager at home in the summer complaining about how bored he or she is, right? This is like the, the bane of a parent. You're not bored. Look at all the things around you to do. All of them is interesting to me. Like, you know, how are you going to do that and present it? Like, that could get really interesting. That could get really fun. These are not very commercial ideas, but they're, they, they might be quite fun. So when you were building out from emotion to function, like this is where you, you, we've taken these foundations. We've said they're built on these loops. So this is still going to be affordance, action, and feedback. So in the case of the, the post-it and the Sharpie game, the affordances were, you know, we have to jump over things. We have to go together. Um, there were things where like, you had to like, both be on a platform or else it wouldn't move, right? And then the feedback was that it moved. And then there was the last one where the affordance was, and, they, and like the, I, think, I think Sharpie could jump higher or something very simple. The affordance was that's a jump that's only makeable by Sharpie. And it's very clear. And they could have done more with the feedback because the person playing the, uh, the post-its would try and try and try. And they probably should have made that a bit clearer. Uh, feedback. And feedback is always actually the hardest part. But there it is. It's all kind of in that loop. And now Sharpie. And some people, by the way, playing the Sharpie would just say, no, I'm not going. I'm not going to finish this game. Like, what I, we're just going to stay here. Um, all with a Sharpie. I have photographs of a Sharpie and a pad of Post-its. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's, all, it's, all, it's all in there, right? It's all in these very simple ideas, but brought out in, in these other contexts. So is this credible? If my, if my goal was to say, I have something like a curriculum, I have something like a set of ideas and exercises that I believe will teach you, in this really short span of time, the things that took me 20 years to learn. That's my question. Well, of course, like, I'm going to say yes, right? I have to say that because I'm here. Um, I think it's really close. And one of the things that has kind of excited me is our students, the students that, at Santa Cruz, when they get stuck, when they've got a game that isn't working, I'll see those diagrams on the whiteboard. And they're like, oh, we totally messed up on the feedback piece on this. Or it's boring because we only have one core loop. We need another loop going on. So we, had, we have a game that's like a ball game um, where the, <clears throat> the characters are jumping around and trying to score. Cool. You've seen that before. It's like a sort of a 2D version of NBA Jam or something. But they realized it was getting pretty dull. And they thought, well, what if we added another loop, which is that you can beat each other up? 
while you're doing it. So you've got Smash Brothers plus NBA Jam, both of which are very simple. But you put them together, and you've got a game that's really emergent and really interesting and actually really fun, which is kind of crazy. But like, that's how that comes from. That's, that's how these ideas can build into uh, actual games. And so this is, this is kind of where the whole idea that I'm talking about goes, which is if we believe in theory, I think, I hope, that people learning this can be better positioned for innovating, for doing new things. Um, a lot of, honestly, a lot of this work that I had to do for myself was during the past three years I spent at Glass Lab, and Keith got to hear some of this, because I needed to be able to communicate what game design is to people who are other professionals in the world of education, who had no idea what it was, and really didn't have the 20 years that it would take to do it the way I did it. And I'm hoping that, that you know, having some of those ideas really kind of works as well in taking the ideas of game design to other, other areas. So, <clears throat> In other words, we get to an and. Um, I would like to believe that, that the, the sort of apprenticeship model under which I learned, um, and yes, I played a lot of Sonic when I was young, um, has brought me to a place where I can actually say, yes, I credibly understand game design. Yes, I can credibly communicate game design. Even if you only give me 25 minutes, I can do my best in such a fashion that people will learn from it and it kind of scales in a way that it could never scale in the apprentice model. So, that, that answers this question then, was, was it worth it? For me, this is, this is worth it. This is kind of my new life's work and I love talking about it. And that's it and we can take questions.